a feed mill can be as far as viral spread within a feed mill um, in an experimental way. So once that virus gets in on the dust or in the snow, as you described, or the liquid off these trucks, boom, the whole place is just lit up. So to me, that's it's not the processing, it's the post-processing uh, contamination that we have to worry about. Swallet. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Scott D., who is the research director for Pipestone Research. Good morning, Scott. How are you this morning? Hi, Laura. Thanks for this opportunity. Looking forward to spending some time with you. Well, we're certainly glad to have you on today. Um, before we get started with the topic, I'd like for you to take a moment and just introduce yourself to the audience. I think a lot of them are familiar with you, but there might be a few on here who aren't. And so maybe just give a little bit more about your background. Sure. Um, let's see. I've been a swine practitioner for 12 years. I was a professor for 12 years at University of Minnesota College of Vet Mad. And I've been a research director at Pipestone for 12 years. So I've been around for 36 years, I guess, in the industry, which I have, maybe I'm a lot older than most of the people listening to this, but uh, it's it's been a great run. And it's kind of funny, I'm not from a farm. I have no agricultural heritage or background. Even in veterinary medicine, I'm the only veterinarian in my entire family tree. Most of my relatives have been doctors or teachers or business people, lawyers, but yeah, so that's a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm from a, I'm from the city too. I'm from a city called Rochester, Minnesota. Did not grow up on any, on a farm, although I've worked on a lot of farms once I figured out what I was going to do. So yeah, it's, it's a little different, uh, approach to becoming a veterinarian and then becoming an egg based veterinarian. It's, it's really different, but it's been fun. <laughs> New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. That's really interesting, Scott. I didn't know that about you, that you weren't from a, from a farm background. So I'm, I'm sure that made for some interesting conversations with the family <laughs> as you started pursuing that career. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about my background is I, I had to apply three times to veterinary school. So I was rejected two times before I got into med school at the University of Minnesota, which is kind of ironic. Uh, but it, it, it put a bit of a chip on my shoulder that when I was a, a vet, finally got in, they weren't going to get rid of me. And then when I went to the University of Minnesota, I actually got on the admissions committee right away and change the whole process to the current process in University of Minnesota. So we, we really modified, I think really made the process better for students. So I don't know if, what, if, if you ever want to talk about admissions, I got a big passion for that. So <laughs> uh, yeah, a very different uh, course of, of entry to the profession. Yeah, absolutely. I think that could be a fun conversation actually for or aspiring veterinarians out there, what what they should be thinking about for, for vet school application. We'll definitely put that on the list. Um, but today's conversation is really about kind of mitigating our biosecurity risks through through the farm, particularly as we think about trying to prevent those foreign animal disease coming in and, and having to worry about a total per depopulation type of situation. And so your your expertise or, or what I think of, I think there are a lot of different things when I think of your name, but one of them certainly is around feed biosecurity and some of the work you've done that shows disease transmission through feed. Um, and so I think let's kind of start the conversation around biosecurity and, and really, you know, what are some key priorities that we should be thinking about with on-farm biosecurity, particularly as it relates to foreign animal disease control? Yes. So 
biosecurity, that's a big topic right now. And I think my background helped me get interested in that because I, without a lot of you know, background on farms and things, I was always asking questions, you know, why, why do we do that? You know, why do we bring supplies in and just put them on the floor instead of making sure they're clean before they come in the farm? Why do we take a shower coming into the farm? Does that really work? How about the trucks when they get contaminated? Could they bring the pathogens to a farm? So those types of questions I would see when people were doing things on farms, and I'd wonder what if they actually worked. And so that's kind of where that all came from, interest in in why we why we do what we do because biosecurity does take a lot of effort. It, it costs a lot of money, but as everybody knows, it's essential for protecting the farm. So that's that's a little bit of background of why I think I got into that, just because curiosity, I think, is one of my traits that's helped me uh, throughout my career. Uh, but to your question, um, when I look at a farm biosecurity protocol or what they're doing or what they're not doing, I tend to look at routes of transmission in two big buckets. I'll call them direct and indirect. Direct routes are, uh, say, infected pigs and semen, for example, sources of contamination that come directly from an animal. So if we use PERS, for example, that's, you know, PERS can be carried in persistently infected pigs, can be shed in, in semen from infected boars. So that's what I call the direct routes. And we've got protocols we can talk about to manage those. The other big bucket I characterize or categorize is what I'll call indirect routes. And these are the non-porcine routes, the non-animal routes. These are, say, the mechanical or fulmite-based routes, trucks, supplies, people, boots, those types of things, inanimate objects that could be contaminated and the, name, it, the virus could be carried into a farm. Um, the next group is, uh, or a next set of risks I call aerosol risks. So some viruses like PERS can go long distance in the air. And so a biosecurity program uh, for aerosol risk, obviously, is air filtration. So we can talk about that. And then finally, and most recently, you alluded to a minute ago, is the risk of feed as a vehicle to transfer viruses around. And this is a real exciting, very emerging area of science, which we discovered in January, 2014. So it's kind of the new kid on the block for uh, a risk factor that we really had never considered. And so those that, that might help kind of put this conversation in a bit of a, a box because we can talk direct, we can talk indirect, and across indirect, we can talk mechanical aerosol feed. I think that's a pretty good way of looking at a biosecurity program when you go to a farm and start asking questions. Uh, what are you doing for all of these various risk factors that we now know? Yeah, and I think that's exactly a good way to start categorizing them. And I, I think for today's conversation, we'll kind of skip the pig side. I think with proper testing, most people can can identify typically pig routes of, of transmission. And so let's focus more on the indirects and um, and feed. The, the one thing that kind of comes to my mind really is um, how do we assess introduction points? You mentioned, and I, I think it's a great one, with 2014, right? That was when PED came into the U.S. And, and certainly it was an area where we were not expecting an introduction of feed. And so as we start the process and we think going forward, are there is there a systematic approach to sitting down and saying where are potential points of introduction of these diseases beyond the pig and the semen? Yeah, I think with that with that category of indirect, I think you can go to a farm and you can just start looking at that farm. And I always start with the mechanical because you're entering the farm. It's always kind of like the first thing you do. So when you look at, when you're checking out the mechanical protocols, you know, you're evaluating what happens when the people enter. Is there a boot bench? You know, is there a shower? 
what are the people what, what do the people have to do to get into the farm? Um, I always look at the entryway when I come into the farm and see if it's clean because a lot of things come into farms and they get set on the floor and then they get passed through the window into the office. That's kind of the old way we used to introduce supplies. And lots of times that entryway is, is, is dirty. It's wet. It's muddy because that's where all the shoes come in. And so that's the point I look at right there. And then obviously looking at how are they managing their supplies is there a D&D room, like a special area where the supplies enter, they get disinfected, they sit for a period of time, and they uh, and then they then they go into the clean side. Uh, the transport, what's the, what's the sanitation of the trucks? How are the trucks being managed when when they go to when they go to say to the market and then come back, or they deliver wean pigs to a clean to finish site? What what happens? after that process to the truck. And so those those types of big, I call them fulmite-based, inanimate object-based risk factors, that's that's the first thing I start looking at because I think that's the easiest way to track virus into a farm. Say, if you talk of PERS, PED, it would clearly be a case if ASF was in the United States, that would easily be transmitted that way as well. And then I, I kind of like to see the culture of the of the farm staff when it comes to biosecurity. How educated are they? So how knowledgeable are they on the routes of transmission of some of these important diseases? What's the inspection process? How is the farm personnel compliance being audited to be sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do? And then three, how are they being rewarded and or penalized if they're doing a good job? If they're really doing a good job and they're following all these rules and taking an extra time to do things correctly, they should be highly compensated. There should be a bonus plan. If, and if they don't, there should obviously be a severe penalty. So I kind of like to understand, start at that level, because to me that's boots on the ground, literally boots on the ground, the people and, and the mechanical routes. You know, in the old days, you step outside and hit the feed bin and walk right back in the barn. You know, is that stuff happening or has that been you know, taught in a proper way to say, you can't do that anymore? So I just kind of, that's kind of how I start because that's basics, fundamentals. <laughs> I think that's a really good basis to start with. And as you were talking through those those different points, I keep thinking in my mind because I've, I've been in many of these conversations around biosecurity and what should be the acceptable steps or protocols. Biosecurity in my mind can be, it's very fatiguing for many of our producers, right? They hear the word over and over. They, they know it's important. They understand the reasoning, but it can be very frustrating at the same time because today I'm doing it this way and tomorrow I might need to think about it differently. And you just mentioned the tracks, right? And and Scott D and the snowball theory is something oh, that yeah. always comes into my mind, right? And the first coming in on the, the snowballs of the truck, the packing underneath the trucks. And now my employees are walking across that snow to get into the farm. And right now I've added another layer of biosecurity. And so how do you help producers that maybe are feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all the potential points of entries or places where we could potentially be be exposing ourselves or our, our shoes or our employees before they even come into the farm. Yeah, so you're the snowball from hell. There we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the that was the, that that project kind of got me started into biosecurity research. And it was really I think I did it in 2000 to put it at a, a timetable. <laughs> so it's a pretty old project, but it was the first example that showed that at least in the case of PERS virus, and I think if I did it with PED, it'd be a very similar outcome, how easy it was to move around pathogens in kind of a, a model that simulated a day in the life of a pork producer. So like you said, the truck got contaminated. Then if you remember, the farmer went to wash it, which was me in this case, I was doing all this. And then, then he stepped in the the snow on the truck wash floor and he walked it into his truck and then the mats got contaminated inside and 
we drove to a, a farm, a simulated farm, and you, you know the rest of the story. Well, we walked it right in, and nobody had ever done that before. And so that kind of got the world aroused a bit as far as, oh my gosh, so what do you do about all this? Because it does get complicated. And to me, the best way to start is just go to the farm, sit down with the people, and make a list of risk factors. See, if we're, if we're talking PERS, how does PERS virus travel? And just like we talked about, we can talk about egg semen and go down the line. And then I start asking questions about what are you doing for people? How do people enter the farm? Or what are you doing for supplies? How are you managing your incoming supplies? And how do you clean your trucks? And I just kind of take it really slow and start with those real first steps because that's where it all begins. If you're not doing that right, you can have the best air filtration system in the world and it's going to fail every day. So, And then I'll just take them down that list of risk factors and see what they're doing. And if they're doing it, does it sound like they're doing it correctly? What do they tell me versus what, say, the order might tell me what is what is the what are the staff actually telling me how they do things and so to me that's the easiest the most important place to start is with the people make sure they really know what they're talking about and then of course look around I mean go look around and see what do they do for personnel entry where is their D and D room uh, let's go to their truck wash how are they managing that you know what's a disinfectant what's a pollution concentration thing. So it's really like detective work, but it all starts with talking with the staff. It's where what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong, or maybe what they're not even doing. You know, where are the holes? Where are the gaps in the, in the program that once we got everything, say, from the mechanical side in place and well-documented, do we take that next step and start talking about airborne risk factors and how do we manage that and then into the feed we go. So that's typically how I do it. Yeah. And that's that's actually a really good systematic approach. And I think the producers remember that you take it in small pieces that maybe doesn't feel quite as overwhelming as starting with the big picture. The stories of the research studies help a lot too. So the story of the snowball, I tell that story. I tell, I tell the story of the production region model we set up for the airborne and air filtration assessment that we did. And then I tell the story of how we figured out the feed thing. So by telling those stories and showing some of the science in a layperson friendly way, kind of what we did, what we learned, that's a good way to kind of demonstrate that there are good data. There's good information out there that supports these risk factors and, and the biosecurity protocols do work if they're done correctly. So weaving that in gives it gives your uh, gives you some credibility because it seems like you you might know what you're talking about if you take it that way. Sure. Well one of the things and you brought it up a couple of times now is feed and and I always think again of the snowball. So um, in the system I was working in when PED came through that was my responsibility. We saw a number of farms within a, a day of each other fall down with, with PED with no logical connection other than feed. And so I spent my day in the feed mill watching the, the trucks come in in the middle of winter and watching the snowpack drip nicely into the pit. And all of a sudden, the light bulb came on and it was like, what if, right? And and so let's talk a bit about feed because I think feed is a little bit elusive to many people because we don't know necessarily the full life cycle of the ingredients that we're using, right? We know, well, soybean meal has been more than likely processed in the United States if we're using certain types. Um, but, you know, we don't know, you know, how that soybean was shipped, where it came from, potential risks and exposure. So let's talk a little bit about how you approach feed as a, as a possible fomite and, and transferring disease. Yes. Yeah, so I remember you did a lot of really good work back then. I remember listening to you and watching you. I thought you did a great job. And my experience is very similar to yours. 
I was at Pipestone at the time, and I think a couple of days in January of 2014, we had a number of farms, very, very biosecure farms with all the mechanical, air filtration, and everything. They, all of a sudden, they all got PED. And they were working from different mills. They were in different states. And the only thing in common was they had a feed outage. They each had a feed outage in one bin somewhere on the farm. On the cell phone. And that delivery of feed, wherever it came from, was the feed that the index cases consumed, which then broke with PED. So I went into those bins and I sampled the inside of those bins and I found some of that material that was hanging up on the walls of the bins. And sure enough, there was live PED virus in that material and we trans we showed transmission. In the experiment. That's kind of how I got started with it. And I think that's always a good story to tell to, to producers is you know, this is kind of how it all got started. So this, this, this is a real world thing. It wasn't just some lab experiment. It was an actual field event that we had made this observation, and then we recreated the crime scene, so to speak, by feeding that material, showing it was live. The virus was live. So that's kind of where the whole thing got started, and uh, it's really changed the game, I think, as far as considering feed as a, as I call it, vehicle. A, a, a matrix to move the viruses around, and that's been expanded across many different viruses, including many foreign animal diseases, and we can get into that. But to your point, I think it's very, very good. The mill is where it all goes down, because I think when we process these ingredients, they're, they're sterile at that time. I mean, they're put through very high temperatures, oftentimes pH stresses, it's not so much the processing, it's post-processing contamination where we get in trouble. And these viruses get into farms and they're spread into the environment on dust particles exhausted from fans as the epidemic is occurring within the facility. And it basically seeds down the whole environment outside the farm, including the ground, including the trucks, including the people, including everything. And then that moves, like you said so well, right into the mill. As, as the vehicles move into the mill, they bring these, these virus particles along with them. And that's how the mill gets uh, seeded down. And Kansas State's done a great job of showing how widespread a feed mill can be as far as viral spread within a feed mill um, in an experimental way. So once that virus gets in on the dust or in the snow, as you described, or the liquid off these trucks, boom, the whole place is just lit up. So to me, that's it's not the processing, it's the post-processing uh, contamination that we have to worry about. During the, the episodes of PED, you had done a, a good number of studies showing taking an ingredient like soybean meal, for example, contaminating it with a virus and letting it sit for a period of time before we then fed it to pigs and you were able to demonstrate that the virus was still present. And I think that raised a lot of questions for individuals, particularly when we think about ingredients coming from overseas. So vitamins, for example, and the potential risk of ingredients can, carrying virus in that, that we normally would include into diets. So how do we manage that? I think, you know, people at the feed mill, we're still learning biosecurity, but that's one I continue to hear is how do we manage the risk of potential incoming ingredients when and you can demonstrate so effectively that the viruses can still be there. Yeah, so I can I can say that we've we've conquered some of it, and there's still some unknown territory. So, with the trace, the fine ingredients, the microbes, the trace minerals, vitamins, I think we've got a pretty good handle on those because the way this works is we will actually have let's say they're coming from China. Just used to use China because we buy a lot of these materials, as you know, from China. We don't make them in the U.S. or else they're so inexpensive that we can save the producer a lot of money if we can safely manage their way across the ocean. So uh, at Pipestone, we have a program called Responsible Imports, which really tries to use science to do just what you're asking. How do we safely introduce? And we'll start at the manufacturing plant in China. We'll actually go there and we'll audit that plant and twice a year and, uh, 
and find out how, you know, what's their biosecurity. And so we'll actually do a lot of the same, take the same approach as we talked a few minutes ago at the, man, at the farm, but also at the manufacturing plant. And so we, should, we start there, we bring the material over in one-time use totes and seal containers to reduce the cross-contamination chances from the manufacturing plant to the ship, so to speak. And then they go onto the ship and they come to the United States and they go into a, a facility run by a company called Sam Nutrition. And Sam Nutrition is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and there's actually a quarantine room where these totes go in and they sit for 30 days at 75 degrees Fahrenheit before they're released into the warehouse, before they're released to the mills. So we've got a very, very well-organized, standardized approach to managing the micro ingredients. Challenge, so I consider them very low risk. I consider that process because how they're manufactured, as well as how that process is, is uh, conducted, I consider those basically, wood point, done deal, very well controlled. The wild card is, is uh, the bulk ingredients we bring in. And uh, as you know, we bring in soybean meal, bring in organic soybean meal from other countries. And we use that for organic farms and for human feeding. Whether it's organic or not, I doubt it. But um, you know, we'll bring, we'll bring some bulk soy in from multiple countries that have AS ASF. So China, Ukraine, India, a lot of these countries that have ASF, Russia, we're bringing soybean meal in to the United States, really kind of in an uncontrolled way because it's, it's easy to do what I described with totes. It's very difficult to do what I described with bulk plumage. So to me, that's the missing piece as far as what we still haven't gotten our arms around. And to me, it's the biggest risk for uh, foreign animal disease entry through feed. So yeah, my kind of I feel real good about one aspect of this, but I'm I'm still really worried about the other. No, I think that's very fair, and that's one that I think we all continue to worry about and discuss. Right, proper storage. How long should we store it when it comes? And certainly, again, storage for something like ASF is not probably feasible from a duration standpoint, but how do we reduce those? Those factors are going to be important. Let's go back then. Let's go back to our mill just for a moment and and think about there again. So um, we've kind of address some incoming ingredients into the mill, but what are some things we should be doing at the mill level today from a biosecurity procedure that, that you think would help reduce potential feed transfer of disease? Yes. And so I approach the mill just like I approach the farm. And so it's first talking with the people, finding out what they understand and, and what they don't understand. I remember when PED in the mill kind of first came up, there was a lot of reluctance at the level of the mill. They felt they were getting blamed. And so we kind of had to break that barrier down. And we weren't the enemy. We were actually just trying to help. So we kind of had to get the people in the right frame of mind which I think has happened. I think that's, we're over all that now for the most part. And then their education, what do they really know? Uh, what are they doing? Do they have any protocols in place for incoming trucks, outgoing trucks? How are they, you know, how are they handling their ingredients when they come in? But what I really like to do is take a paint roller on a big pole and walk around that mill and just take environmental samples at different points in that mill and test them for PED and just see if there's any contamination at the mill already. Uh, where is, where can you find the virus? Is it in the receiving area, the pit? Is it on the stairs up to the office? You know, where can we find any evidence of potential contamination at the ground level? And then we could put interventions in place and then we can monitor to see if the interventions are, are effective or not. So that's kind of how I approached mills when it was PED. And obviously we can't test for ASF, but if we ever did get ASF, I think I'd approach it the same way. I just kind of want to see what are the, where are the 
risk points in the mill and how can we intervene at those specific points and the nice thing about that is at first the millers were very reluctant to do that and sure enough we found virus they felt they were going to get in trouble but we just kept testing over time as they intervened and sure enough we showed that uh, it went away i mean the, the the biosecurity plans worked and the virus level was gone and then they were all excited about testing and they really wanted to kind of use it as a promotional tool to show how well their mill was doing. And so we, we kind of spun it in a way, psycho, almost psychologically, where rather than being the, the problem, we were the solution. And now the mill was certified, really, as, a, say, a PED-free mill. I think with PED, it was a really good learning opportunity for all of us, right? It was not anyone's fault. It was simply lack of knowledge that the led us to make change. And that's generally what happens, right? We learn something and because of that, we make a change. And um, we've seen some great things at, at females now with different entry points for ingredients versus outgoing feed and um, covers and, and just even you know boxes for, for what goes under the pits. And so I think for our listeners today, you know, if you're curious about some of those procedures, they're well-documented. Um, do a Google search and you can find some some different uh, presentations and material on, on different ways to approach biosecurity at the feed mill. But I do think that, that because of PED, um, good or bad, right, we've learned some things as an industry and it's allowed us to make some, some very good changes for potential future issues. Yeah, feed mill biosecurity used to be an oxymoron. It, it didn't exist, but now it does. And like you say, it's there are some very basic things you can do that are make a big difference. Just spent some time in Mexico and saw some feed mills there, and just fantastic what they've done. You know, separate entry and exit points, use of feed mitigants in the mill to kind of reduce contamination. They've really taken it to heart. Washing feed trucks. It was quite intense, and I think it's it kind of helps you take feed off the risk factor list. If you're looking at an investigation of how a virus got in the farm, if you're doing these things correctly, I think you can cross it off the list and, and, and look elsewhere, look at the other routes, the other risk factors. So this all can be done. Absolutely. Well, Scott, I think we could probably talk for hours on, on your work and opportunities for better biosecurity, but unfortunately our time is wrapping up. Um, but before we kind of jump over to the other set of questions, I'd like for you to maybe give a couple of key takeaway points for our listeners today as they, they leave our discussion. Yes. And so I'd say for the producers that are listening, you know, work closely with your veterinarian and your nutritionist and ask questions. Always have a list of questions for them be it on biosecurity, you know, ask what's new in the research. What, what are the new findings? Has anything changed? For the veterinarians in particular, I challenge the veterinarians to be up to speed on what's actually happening scientifically in regards to this, the risk factors of disease transmission and what are the new areas of biosecurity interventions that have been talked about at meetings or published. So you can answer those questions. You've really got to lead that producer. And the best way to lead is by having the knowledge, being the source of knowledge, and leadership. So I think that's something I take for both the producers and for any of the veterinarians that were listening. Be curious, producers and veterinarians. Be educated and be prepared to lead. Very good. It's time for our famous three. Curious to discover if you can manage your animal data and team's work with the touch of a finger? Some of the best and largest pig farm holdings worldwide use cloud farms to collect and analyze data like never before. How? With the most advanced mobile app to collect data accurately and super fast. For breeding, farrowing, weaning, and finishing. Also, this is the easiest way to assign tasks to your team and motivate to work more efficiently. You instantly understand what gets done on time and what doesn't. So yes, you can manage your animal data with the touch of a finger.
an animal nutrition technology company offering innovative products and new applications for the swine industry. The combination of AB Vista enzymes, technical services, and nutrition expertise provides the industry with new opportunities to further improve production efficiencies. Fiber is receiving renewed interest due to its influence on the microbiome, and AB Vista has brought together research experts to discuss the industry's knowledge of fiber functionality and to introduce a Stimbiotic, targeted to improve fiber digestion. To request access, contact NAM at abvista.com. That's N-A-M at abvista.com. Well, Scott, we'd like to ask our guest speakers just a couple of, of questions. Um, the first question we like to ask is, what is a swine resource book that is considered your go-to that you would recommend to our listeners today? A book or resource, a swine resource. Oh, yeah, for me, the, the best resource I use almost every day is, is PubMed. And PubMed is a National Library of Medicine online, and you can look for papers on certain topics that you're studying. So anytime I have a question, I immediately go to PubMed and type in what I'm looking for. And then it up come the publications, and I start studying. So to me, that's the easiest way to, to go to... Uh, the computer and let the computer search for you. Ironically, when I was starting the PED investigation in 2014, I put PED and feed in the PubMed and no citations came up. So <laughs> it was the first time that I'd ever done that where there was absolutely no information on that topic, of that virus and feed. And so boy I said, man, I'm screwed. <laughs> so, yeah. so, <laughs> we, so we did what we did, but uh, that's what I do for it. Yeah, I, I, I go right away up to the National Library. That's, that's just the way I buy it. So I, I go there. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great resource for sure. Well, how about something that's not pig-related? Is there a book, there are an audiobook or something that you've listened to recently that you would recommend to the group that, that you found interesting? Uh, well, this is really out of the box a bit, but I'm a musician. And so the the, the thing I really like to do is listen to the Beatles. And uh, the Beatles' White Album is my favorite album of the Beatles. Oftentimes, I'll put that on as I'm driving, and it just refreshes me and gets me excited, and enter, you know, kind of recharges the batteries. It's nothing to do with pigs, but it it, it gets the right side of my brain uh, fired up again. Which obviously, the creative side, the left side is working all the time on the pig side. I like to let the creative side. Have a have a little time as well. So the Beatles White Album. Mm -hmm. oh, that's very good. I'll have to turn that on. I always listen to music, especially when I'm writing. I need yes. that that stimulation on the other side of the brain to to stay focused. So very good. I'll have to put that one on my my listening list. Well, my last question for you is: If you can think of somebody uh, in your life that you have defined as successful, what's a trait about them that has allowed them to be successful? I'd say the, the most inf influential person in my veterinary science career was the late Carlos Dujuan, who people might remember Carlos. He was a professor at the College of Ed Med, University of Minnesota. He passed away a few years ago now, but he was, uh, he was on my PhD committee. I was a faculty member with him side by side, and we were very close friends. And so he was not only a wonderful person. He was a great scientist. And what he was really keen on, what made him the way he was, was his curiosity. He was so curious and he was always asking questions and always looking at things in different ways. So curiosity is a characteristic of Carl's, one of the many strengths he had. But if I could pick one thing that defined the late Dr. Pilon was, uh, was curiosity. So I miss him very much. I think about him every day, and he certainly shaped me into what I am. So I like that question because I always like to recognize somebody who's helped me along the way. And today it's saying uh, thank you to Carlos. Well, it's wonderful. Yeah, he was a very, very talented individual. Yeah. Well, Scott, I uh, do see our time has, has concluded, and I do want to again thank you for your time today. 
For our listeners, this is Dr. Scott D., who is an Emeritus Director at Pipestone Research. Scott, thank you again so much. Thank you, Laura. I really had fun. I hope your listeners enjoy it.